All right, we will get started. My name is Sharon Roberson, and I am president and CEO of the YWCA Nashville in Middle Tennessee. I welcome you to our Stand Against Racism series, teaching and talking about U.S. history. This is presented by the Regions Foundation, and we thank them so much for having the forward-thinking cor corporate goal of making sure that we have these important conversations in our community. Today's subject, when we started thinking about what would be uh, something important to bring to the community, to have a conversation about, to have a very inviting and welcoming atmosphere, was the issue of education. Historically, education has been used or restricting education has been used as a tool to disenfranchise and marginalize people. There was a time in the 1800s where it was actually illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write. This lasted, lasted for centuries. We also know that the history of the Supreme Court in saying that there was some sort of merit in a separate but equal system which had the effect of hurting black children of not investing in their education. We know that even though in 1954 with the case of Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka and saying that this was not acceptable, that for years after children of color were subjected to extraordinarily negative educational experiences. So we do know that education is important and we do know that it has been a tool to attack individuals in this country by limiting their education. When we first started talking about this subject material, I actually wanted this session to be named something different. I wanted this to be Stand Against Racism, Balancing Patriotism and the Teaching of US History. Now, as I have seen, my staff was very forward thinking and they thought that that might be a negative title for this session. One of the things they thought about is really the idea and concept of being a patriot might be viewed as a negative. I, however, personally view it as a positive because I do not like to mix the issues that if you criticize the United States of America, somehow you do not believe in the country. And today what we're gonna talk about is something that I believe makes the country better. And that is educating us on the history, however negative the history of this country has been to educate us so that we can live up to what I view as the proposed ideals of the founders. You know, how I say that proposed ideals of the founders and we can sit in that place and really have the America, the United States that we hope that we will have. I'm gonna start off by asking questions. I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and they will tell you initially about their work and why they think that this topic is so important for our children today. I'm gonna to start with Dr. Williams. Good morning, uh, good afternoon rather. Uh, I'm LaRotha Williams Jr. Associate Professor of African American and Public History at Tennessee State University. I teach courses that explore slavery and emancipation in Tennessee. I teach reconstruction, um, civil rights. Wow, basically I teach African-American history from the moment we arrive, no, even before that, from 15th century Africa to the day before yesterday. Um, teaching history um, for me is important because it, um, it, it prepares us for the present and for the future. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. I, um, in my class, oftentimes talk about us maybe being on the street and encountering somebody that, you know, you speak to them, they don't know their name, where they came from, they don't know anything, they have no memory. We don't just turn people like that loose into the community. Why? We got to work for that. They're suffering 
from amnesia. That's something that needs to be treated because without memory, you're not able to even negotiate this world. In other words, um, history is important because it, it, it prepares us to deal with what we see. It helps us interpret what we see. And it also gives us some guidance into what the future might hold. I'm not suggesting that it trains us to be um, um, people that can predict the future. Um, no, not by any means, but it equips us with strategies, with ideas, with methods that enable us to address whatever we see going forward. Um, so that's why the, the teaching of history is, is critical, I think, especially by the time you get to where I am at in college. This study of history should inform every single discipline that you encounter at the university. Because bear in mind, they, they didn't just invent nursing when a student shows up at college or library sciences. All of that knowledge that you're getting there is based upon history. So um, all that is to say it is, at least in my mind, one of the most critical subjects you can study. All right, Ms. Blackman, same question. Thank you. Um, I'm Andrea Blackman, and I, I enter into this conversation today with these amazing um, group of colleagues. Thank you so much. Um, Sharon and everyone else for, for putting this group together. Um, I enter into this conversation as an educator, um, as a podcaster, as a content creator. Um, I currently serve as the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer for the City of Nashville. Prior to that, I served um, as the curator and the content um, designer for the Civil Rights Center at the Nashville Public Library. Um, I also teach, I've taught kindergarten, um, all the way up third grade, sixth grade, and I still teach undergrad at both Lipscomb and Vanderbilt. So I enter primarily as an educator, but also as a mother, as a mother whose son was one of few um, students of color educated in Nashville schools and having those tough conversations of how wanting to reenact the Civil War um, was traumatic for he and two other young men of color. I also enter this conversation being um, sensitive to understanding how some educators aren't as comfortable as those of us who are content creators and teaching certain elements and historic harms. Um, so I've spent the past 19 years helping educators and parents um, navigate this idea of history and historic harms and getting teachers comfortable in how we have a daily practice and commitment to educating. Um, you said earlier, Sharon, this idea of creating our forefathers and the founders of, of this country, um, intent or not intent. I spend a lot of time looking at intent versus impact. I spend a lot of time helping educators understand how we approach um, pedagogy and mythology and how do we do that with historic arms present? Um, how do we do that with a lens that's fair? And how do we do that with bringing our own 500 years of experiences into the classroom or to in any public space? So I enter into this conversation from that realm. All right, Ms. Gonzalez, uh, how do you, does this topic relate to your work? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Great, can you all hear me? Because I was having some technical issues prior to the panel. Um, but good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Wilmaris Gonzalez. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. When I was asked and then saw everyone else on the panel, I was like, really, me? Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, I am the Senior Manager of Engagement and Operations at the Education Trust Tennessee. Ed Trust is a national ed policy research and advocacy organization. We have offices across the country and in different states, and we started the Ed Trust office last January. So all of our advocacy efforts, policy and research is focused now here in Tennessee and at some district level providing support. Um, I guess more context just about me. I am a very proud Jersey born Boricua. My parents, my family are uh, there from Puerto Rico, but I was actually raised here in the South. So I'm also somewhat of a proud Tennessean. I'm 
educated P through 16 plus through the public school system here in Tennessee, graduated from UT Knoxville, and I'm finishing my master's of education now at Peabody at Vanderbilt. So truly like Tennessee through and through. Um, and I think in my role and why this topic is important, I also taught history and geography prior to entering the nonprofit sector a few years ago. Um, and I think now in my role, I work directly with students. I work with student leaders and advocates across the state through two different programs. One is Empower Ed, and it's really about storytelling and how do we tie storytelling and our lived experience to policy change and advocacy, and also with our policy council students. We have a P12 and a higher ed council, and we also have students serving in that capacity, but they're also integrated into our other programming. And I would say so much of sort of my philosophy of, of change, theory of change, you could say, is I believe that I have to start with the self, which was not offered to me in my educational journey, but off like starting with the self, who am I? What, what, is, what is my culture? How does that impact how I show up, operate and move in this world? Then what is our collective identity? And then I think we can get work done. I think we can mobilize and we can organize and we can inform and do the work that's so important. But I think we have to honor and acknowledge students lived experiences and legislation like what Bill Lee just signed negates that. It's saying that their lived experience doesn't matter. It's saying that what they're bringing to the classroom and what their families are bringing doesn't need to be discussed or needs to be discussed in some roundabout way to appease certain populations that are, are dominant and in control. So this is, I can get real riled up about this. I'm excited for this conversation. Um, and just again, happy to be here, y'all. Okay, well, Dr. Bug, let us hear from you about your work and why you feel as though this topic is important. Absolutely, good afternoon, everyone, and to the fellow panelists, uh, honored to be here with you and to the Sharon Robertson, we have so much respect <laughs> for you and your organization and what you do. Uh, so I'm Dr. Maya Bug. I'm entering this space as a former educator. I used to be a middle school uh, English teacher almost 20, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Um, I also <laughs> entered this space as currently the CEO of the Tennessee Charter School Center. The Tennessee Charter School Center is the state's what's called a charter support organization. And what that means is we work and fight on behalf of public charter school families and the leaders of those schools to make sure that the children who have decided to attend those schools have access to resources to make sure that they are learning properly, that they have high quality education. We believe that everybody should have access to a high quality public school a traditional school or charter school, it doesn't matter which one, you should be able to open up your door and walk down your street and go to a high quality school. Part of being a high quality school, in addition to of course being safe, being loved, being cared for, uh, being taught to, to read and write, uh, you know, beyond just proficiency and basic level, is being able to see yourself in the curriculum, is being able to feel affirmed, is being able to feel valued. And we believe that is a piece of having a high quality education. Uh, for me, I also come as a mother of three girls and an advocate in my spare time, because I'm sure we all have so much of it. You know, we're pushing our, our district here in Tennessee and uh, Williamson County to be more inclusive, to take um, hard stances against racism that our children are experiencing. Um, and so uh, there's a couple of the moms on the call now. And of course, we all have full-time jobs. We all have kids. We all have other responsibilities, but it's really super important to us that our children see us moving and fighting on their behalf. Um, and so uh, at the Tennessee Charter School Center, all these things kind of collide. And we're, we, we work a lot on policy, a lot on advocacy, and then we also provide uh, strategic support to schools to help improve or enhance their quality. You're on mute. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons that this was such an important topic is because there have been legislative efforts across the country to limit how we go about teaching history. Uh, for instance, I was most recently looking at the Articles of Succession and seeing how even though everyone wants to talk about states' rights was the reason that we had the Civil War, which is every last one of these Articles of Succession talks about slavery. We don't want to give up these enslaved populations. So we know there is more history that is not presently being taught. 
I want to start with you, Dr. Bug. Can you share your understanding and perspective on this type of what I see as very limiting legislation and how it could impact our children and really our entire country and our community? First, I'll just name that these types of restrictions have informally been in place from the beginning, right? We know our public schools were never created to teach us about justice, to create equitable systems, to create equitable outcomes, right? So we've already had these things in place. Whether or not you had these discussions in your classroom really was dependent upon your teacher or the ethos of your school leader, right? And so now we've got it formalized across several states. Um, I think a lot of it really comes from a misunderstanding of what culture, uh, critical race theory is. That's a very specific niche piece of our conversation about racism, right? And we know a piece of that is targeting the, the concept that race is uh, uh, a social construct and that it has a bit of permanence in our society, right? That is ingrained in who we are in the fabric of our country. And what happens here when people don't quite understand the concept behind critical race theory um, and other just ideas around racism, well, it starts to feel like a personal affront to the hard work that you've done. Because one of the main pieces that we see in the bills across our country is there's a pushback against talking on, on white privilege. Um, and so I think there's just this tension of understanding that you can work hard, but also be a beneficiary of white privilege. White privilege is not something you ask for, right? White privilege is not something you have to go sign, you know, subscribe to, right? You, you are assigned it, not by any fault of your own, but because of the, the historical background of our country. And a lot of people just don't understand that connection, that you can work hard, you can be underprivileged and be a white person, but still benefit from white privilege. I think the other thing we're missing too is that there's some specific legislation around critical race theory, but it technically does not take away our ability to have culturally responsive education in our classrooms. So we can still affirm our children. We can still value their identities and use that to build upon what we teach them. Um, we can still use where they come from in order to make sure that they know that you are valued here. So I wanna make sure that we don't get too paralyzed with the technicalities of some of these bills, which are unfortunate and, and going to be quite harmful, um, but realize that there's still some other things that can happen in the classrooms. We talk about what's gonna be some of the harm in not talking about racism in the classroom. If we're all quite candid, we know we talk to our uh, children of color. You all, I am in this room that has those lights that when you don't move, yeah. okay. turn my, I'm gonna turn my camera off while I can continue to talk so you don't see me waving my arms looking yeah. like that, okay? Um, so one of the main things though that we should know is that we talk to our children, our black children in particular about race and racism every day, right? So a lot of people are concerned that our children are too young to have these conversations, but our black children uh, are not too young to, be shot down with a toy gun, right? Our black children are not too young to witness their parent murdered in the front seat of a car stop, right? They're not too young to videotape a cop murdering a person in the middle of the street. So racism is a part of the everyday conversation really in, in many of our homes of color, in our black homes in particular. Um, so I think the, the danger here is going to be continuing the cycle of not talking about racism mm -hmm beyond black people, black people talking about it with their our, our kids trying to protect them. Uh, and that's where you get these misunderstandings, this 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 fear. Um, and so I, it is gonna be quite important that we look for some ways to still have these conversations um, beyond just our, our black families. All right, Ms. Gonzalez, tell us a little bit more about this. We have this legislation is going forward really is a way of silencing these conversations. Why do you think it's important? Why do our children need to understand racism? Why is this a subject that we need to discuss? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I definitely think legislation like this is inherently violent and harmful and it's rooted in denial and it's because it makes people feel uncomfortable for them to like examine you know, their own history, what their ancestors did. And I feel like you should feel uncomfortable or it should maybe feel 
be uncomfortable to discuss because it's a shameful and dark history, but it's the reality as well. So I think it's inherently violent and harmful for us to not talk about these things. And also with this type of legislation, it's beyond race too, right? You're talking about censoring conversations around gender and sexuality. So you're talking about also students coming in at the intersections of different identities and that not being a, a point of discussion. Again, that's harmful. Because how do you see yourself or how do you acknowledge the, all of you and all the parts of you in a space that is intended to be safe, even though we know that's unfortunately not even the case of American public schools often, uh, but it is intended to be a community space of healing and of learning. Um, I also think that there's a lot of tones of American exceptionalism when it comes to like pieces of legislation like this. I think we love to critique other countries like China or Russia and say that they are censoring or that they deny this to their people. Well, how is this any different? This is an example of American exceptionalism to erase centuries of history, to not acknowledge uh, to not acknowledge and have critical and difficult conversation, because that is how you grow. I think most of us know, or I know from my own lived experience, some of the most challenging times I've experienced in my life have also been the moments where I've grown the most, where I've gained the most perspective. So it's, again, just going back to it being harmful and shameful and just violent. And I also think we have to switch the narrative that white people don't have culture. I think because they are viewed as dominant and at the center, they view themselves as not having culture or even other communities of color or minoritized communities view them as not having culture, but they do. So I think it even erases that within this conversation too. And granted, some of their culture is violent, right? Based on history. And again, that's uncomfortable, but how do you grow and how do we break systems and cycles of harm without having conversation about them? Um, and I think above all, like in my role and why it's important is just the development of the socio-political consciousness of students, again, this strips it away. Um, challenging conversations are needed to heal and to move forward. And although I, I agree with Dr. Bug too, that I think we should not let this, this bill or types of bills like this paralyze us because we also know where's the implementation of this? Where's the accountability? It's, there's 147 districts in Tennessee, it's massive, um, but it is discouraging because uh, we know that there are critical educators in Tennessee although there's probably less than more, uh, we know that they're there and bills like this are just harmful. Okay, Ms. Blackman, let's talk about this. We're, we're sitting here, we've had this legislation. We know that legislation like this can have a chilling effect, make people afraid to mention certain subjects, make, you af make teachers afraid to even bring up the subject of racism. What do you think, what is the effect of this? How are we gonna move forward? I, I think we start with looking at the reality that there is no national standard or criteria for how, how we teach history. I'm not saying that we should have one, but because we because of the absence of a standard, we have, um, let's see, what, seven states that don't even mention slavery at all in any his, history curriculum. We have eight states that don't even talk about the civil rights movement, let alone a modern civil rights movement. They may mention Dr. King in February. And then we have two other states in this great union that won't even mention the word white supremacy. So we start there with legislation, right? And I think if we look at Tennessee without making any blame, without taking any party line, we can look at what has just unfolded two representatives going at it on the floor. One of them saying that, you know, using the three-fifth compromise as a way to justify, to justify why we should or should not, should not be teaching, even using the word race in any of our classrooms. The idea of saying that um, critical race theory is somehow anti-white curriculum, and that is what we're doing. You have that representative on the floor arguing with another representative in our state saying, no, when we erase exactly as what our other two panelists have said, when we erase the history of our students and our families, then we have erased entire generations. And that's what we've done with history. And if you think about just the children of the modern civil rights movement, just Nashville alone, how many of those grandchildren 
are in our metro schools, that their grandparents were the ones who helped desegregate those schools. They just finished an amazing book talking about some of that. If we look at how many of those kids are students right now in our public schools, just in our district alone. So what we're telling them is that their family isn't valuable. We're legislating this idea that their stories are not important, that their stories do not hold weight or value as any other narrative or story. Um, we can look at just the demise or trying to um, how schools are now saying that the 1619, um, you know, the whole project being how Nora Hannah Jones, her tenure is up for grabs. So not only are we talking about um, K through 12, we're also talking about higher ed, you know, and the bigger issue here is how we continually use this idea to to make attempts to rationalize through our syllabus, through our curriculum, some way of saying that we can justify supremacy and justify racism. That is at the core of all of this legislation that is being passed. I encourage all of our attendees today to go back and reread um, W.E. Du Bois' what, Propaganda of History. Let's start there. Let's start there as, as educators, as community members, as parents and lawmakers. If we start there and seeing how it's not that we're trying to erase or completely guilt all of the white students in any one district. The reality is Du Bois tells us what will happen when we have a propaganda of history. Um, so I encourage us to, before we think about moving forward in legislation, one of the things that I'm most um, excited about is, as Dr. Bug mentioned, just because we have legislation, should, we should not shy away from opportunities to educate our students. One of those um, ways is how do we utilize our public spaces? You know, having a civil rights center or a civil rights museum and being able to curate public spaces, public spaces that students can learn accurate history. Because if we look at just Tennessee and the fight that was on the floor, the whole idea of using the three-fifth compromise was an error. It's we're teaching our children the false, all, everything false about history. And so we're creating a new generation of falsity based on proposed laws, proposed legislations, or one person's perspective. And not using that same lens or that same criteria for asking, um, why can't we, our students have their own stories and their own perspectives and their own lenses as part of our, um, our classroom experience. All right. Well, Dr. Williams, you've heard these other conversations. You're the historian. Can you kind of give us a broad historical context on what this legislation is trying to stop? Why are these legislators standing there feeling as though there's this level of censorship in our history? Um, in order for white supremacy, white supremacy to thrive, we have to either ignore it or just pretend as though it doesn't exist. Um, I, I, when I heard about this bill, I, I my first thought was immediately: Has um, you know, has there ever been a time in this nation's history where we have? taught history the way that it should be taught. Um, for most of our existence here as African Americans, we have been excluded from the educational process. Then once we get in, it, it, it is we are we're taught things that marginalize us, that teach us to look at each other through the lens of our oppressors. And even as we get into the 20th century, and this is where I think critical race theory comes in. And it's um, one of the things that's troubling to um, a lot of people who sponsor these bills is that um, it causes us to think whether or not the, the way that we've even been fighting for equality has been sufficient. Um, and, and here's a couple of questions I want folks to think about out there. Um, you know, we had the Brown case in 1954, right? Um, May 1954. Are our schools less segregated today as opposed to 1954 when that, when the, the, the decision came? Is racism as pre prevalent today 
as it was when my father came through high school or when my father was a young man. Have things gotten better? If they've gotten better, if you can say, yeah, they gotten better, then how come it's so hard for black folks to vote? I, um, I, I, I struggle with this as somebody that has studied history for the last 20 some odd years, right? Um, but I, I, I can't honestly say that things have, have gotten better, especially in light of the, this past year. But I'm, I'm charged to study and teach it, right? So how do, how do I do that? One thing that um, Andrea said that I thought was really, really important is that we need to kind of think very creatively about where we teach history. I teach a course called Black Nashville. And although I think I do a pretty good job in the classroom, the students really enjoy when we go out to Black spaces, when they can interact in the spaces where many of their ancestors have, 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 have made history. So we'll go to the public square, we'll go to the corner of Fourth and, and 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 Martin Luther King, where they sold slaves. We'll go to Fort Negley, which has recently been designated as um, an, a UNESCO site. So changing the classroom, um, changing how we think as teachers of history and how we just engage that whole process. And I say that as as a guy who started teaching. My first history class was in 1999, but if you were to go to that, you were to go to that classroom and see how I did it and pay attention to how I teach today, you would see two different things, something diametrically, almost diametrically opposed because, um, you know, we've learned a whole lot over those 20 some odd years. So we know more so our teaching of history should have improved as well. For um, any teachers out there, um, bear, in mind, bear in mind that you got to stay on top of the game. The stuff that you learned in grad school or in, as an undergraduate, you know, if you graduated five, six, seven years ago, um, a lot of that stuff we're not even fooling with anymore. Um, so you must stay on top of your game. And lastly, and, and this is where I'm doing some really deep thinking because um, I'm a professor at an HBCU. And as a professor at a university, you know, there's some expectation of um, academic freedom, right? Um, I should be able to think, I should be able to toss ideas out there, good and bad, bad ideas and not have to worry about any repercussions. Um, Events of this last year has led me to think that, you know, just my presence in the space might not be enough to insulate me. Um, if y'all have been paying attention to um, what happened to the professor at Ole Miss, who was an advocate and it cost him his job. Um, as a historian at an HBCU, I, I, I see myself and I try to center my students in the sort of ethos that has guided these universities throughout their existence. You know, you go there to get an uh, education, but every faculty, your auntie them, mama them, all of them expect for you to do something with that education to make your communities a better place. So while they're at TSU, learning history, they are sometimes accompanying me to Metro Historical Commission meetings, or they are engaged historians. They are historians that are indeed learning their history, but they're learning how history can shape political decisions. So this bill for me, it's troubling, but it's nothing new. They're putting on paper things that I already knew were in, in place. Um, but it's compelling me to 
think very critically about how I teach history, how I can improve what I'm doing. All right. Now, it's interesting you're saying that this is really just, I guess, memorializing what was already in place as far as the restrictions on how we go about teaching our history in the classroom. And we always like for our panelists to leave the audience with some sort of tools. What can an individual, I'm hearing this, and we've had, had some questions. They're saying, what could I do? What can I do in my community? What can I do to make sure that our children have a better shot at understanding and being taught our history? I'll start again with you, Dr. Williams. What can an individual do? I know you can talk around your dinner table. You could talk to your children. You can talk to church families. But what can you do as far as influence the educational system at large? Well, the first point you made, I think, is critical. And that is um, allowing those lessons to start in your home. From there, you should have, and, and this I think is important. We need to institutionalize the teaching of history before we even send our students to school. So that could be within the church or um, the mosque, however you get down, that it, it, it should start there as well. Um, then also the engagement with the community beyond just, you know, going and buying and, and, and selling of things, engagement in the community. So when the, if something at your community center or if there's something going on um, that that is rooted in the community's history if there's something going on that cultivates a love for that space I think it should start there um, but in all of this I it, it's important I think to teach our children to love themselves, to value themselves, to embrace what they look like, the people around them before they even get into these schools. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that um, um, whenever there's an opportunity to teach your history, to teach your, your culture beyond the schools or outside of the schools or before these students get there, this, um, we should embrace that. We should um, support that. Because for much of our history, and I say this as an educator that was trained in the system, um, a lot of what I was taught was adversarial to my development as a Black man, um, as a, a, a a person that valued black history. I didn't, I had one black male teacher um, in the public school system in Tallahassee, Florida. I had two black women that taught me. So when it came time to have black history lessons, um, you know, outside of February, that was pretty much it. So if, if we, are still struggling with developing our schools as places where we can get our history, both good, the bad, and uh, and thirdly, the the ugly. Um, I, I I think that the the places, our cultural spaces, our social spaces, should be the places that we get our history. So if that entails us organizing book clubs, okay, do that if that entails us putting together plays or shows or even i can remember reading about a political debate that was um that was held at pearl high school and this was during the now this is during roughly around 1907 this quick story i know my stories are sometimes long but this one's going to be quick um yeah, high schoolers 
debating whether or not um, it would be better for black folks to form their own political party as opposed to embracing the Republican or Democratic Party. And so when I read that, I, I thought about what an understanding of history that they had to have in, in high school. So, and, and this, this, this program was actually hosted by a church, right? Mount Olive did this. So these type of spaces can be spaces that can supplement, that can augment, and oftentimes make up for the deficiencies that we have in schools, at least until we get our act together in schools. Okay, Ms. Gonzalez, what are your words of wisdom for the group to take away? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, this question made me think of a friend that uh, we were talking about this bill last week and she's heavily involved in uh, immigration activism like here in the city, but also nationally. Um, and she felt bad for not knowing that this bill had even passed, that it even existed and was really beating herself up. And I was like, hey, like, first of all, that's not gonna help any of us because there's so much going on. So I think first, like if you're, all, if you're sitting in the audience or listening to this conversation or felt like you didn't have a lot of context for this, I think give yourself a little bit of grace because I know I miss things and I think there's a lot there's a lot going on. There's a lot of information shared, a lot of misinformation shared, and a lot of different systems and levers at play. Also, I don't think that is by mistake, quite frankly, um, which is another conversation. But I think, you know, starting getting plugged into organizations that are tracking this. I mean, I'll do a shameless plug for Ed Trust and I'll drop um, our website in a moment. But if you can sign up, you know, you can sign up for our newsletter. We're going to host a couple events in a Twitter chat related to this topic today but we're also tracking every legislative session, bills that align with our policy priorities. And a lot of it that's focused on equity and justice. So we'll let you know every week on Friday, what happened at the legislature? What is it that we're watching? Is there something or a letter that you can sign on to a petition? Whenever it's safe to do so, we hope in 2022 to start hosting Day on the Hill again, right? And hosting events and organizing folks. So I'll drop that in a moment. Um, but I think, you know, I'll echo a lot of what has already been said that it's never too young to start these conversations. It does happen at home. I know that that was the case for me, especially once we moved to Tennessee, that was a huge culture shock for my family. Um, and I know that was a conversation we had at home, but it, it was, you know, growing up, I didn't see myself in a lot of ways culturally reflected in text. I didn't even have the understanding of Puerto Rico's, uh, status related to the US until I got to college even. So I think, you know, so much of this uh, has to just totally, you know, almost like an overhaul, I think what Dr. Williams was saying of how getting almost to like a sense of consensus of where we start and how we tell our, our history, because there has to be a lot of reframing. Um, but I think that it's never too late to start these conversations um, and to just give yourself grace and to, and to stay plugged into organizations that are tracking and following these conversations, I think is a great place to start and also a place where you can take action too. Okay, thank you. Ms. Blackman. Thank you. Um, I, you, you ask, what can we do as an individual? So I'll, I'll look at it from- What advice you individuals. might give to an individual? <laughs> what I might give to, ad, advice I might give to an individual. Um, to a parent who is an individual parent, he, she, they. Or even any community member that might say, I want to do something. I want to accomplish. I want to help. I would, I would start questioning systems. I would question the fact that only 10% of our classroom time is actually dedicated. Um, not This is a national standard. 10% of our instruction time is actually dedicated to Black history, African-American history, people of color any other group that is not um, what is perceived as dominant, I would question that. An individual, you can question that. Um, as an individual community member, I would stay plugged in to, as Lee, uh, Dr. Williams mentioned earlier, other places, public spaces that we can garner and glean history. I would utilize the narratives that I know exist here in our local city and beyond. So for instance, the civil rights oral history has over 130 oral histories of people who stood against Nashville's response to Brown, people who dismantled segregated institutions, firsthand accounts, 
free information that is out there to help us make our own assumptions, to challenge these narratives that we're being told, whether it's on the House floor, whether it's in the media. Um, so an individual can do that and have access to all of that information. I would suggest as an individual that we also help our students, help our children understand the importance of their narrative and the importance of challenging systems. I think we figure out a way to normalize conversations and being safe and creating spaces, whatever space we're in, that we can actually say the word supremacy. I suggest to any individual that we can collectively um, review our children's homework. So when our kids are bringing their homework home, we can do an assessment of ourselves. We can say who's missing from this story, who's missing from this narrative, what voice, is there only one perspective in this history lesson or in this, you know, literature piece that we're reading? Um, we can challenge that as an individual and we can also do that collectively. Um, I also think that we, we get very uncomfortable, as um, Ms. Gonzalez said, with being uncomfortable. I don't, I don't ever remember a time in history that any one group was comfortable, except for maybe, maybe a dominant culture, but I think we get comfortable as society with being uncomfortable. For instance, this whole idea in, in Arizona, um, what's going on in their legislation was because one white student said that teaching about slavery made, was, was triggering her and causing her trauma. I want us to take that same response as a parent to look at the trauma when we teach the Civil War that black and brown students feel every day. So I want us to look at things collectively in a different way. If we could collectively shift our whole way of thinking um, about historic harms and trauma, then we could collectively change. And that can be in your classroom, you Joe citizen, Jane citizen, um, that could also happen as a parent, challenging those systems and asking the questions, putting ourselves in places um, where we're having these types of conversations, knowing that the miseducation of schools and miseducation continues to happen. Okay, Dr. Bug. Listen, I, I hope my lights don't go out again. It's happened <laughs> five times. I'm going to speak to a couple of things that Ms. Blackman mentioned. She, she mentioned that there are different systems to consider. And I just want to remind us that education is one of those systems and there are so many others that we need to better access and leverage in these conversations. Ms. Blackman also mentioned trauma. As we look at our other systems, our churches, our, our um, care and, and, and support in our communities, I think we also need to be careful not to center our understanding of history on trauma. And one thing that um, myself and some of the other parent advocates are doing in, in, in our district, and one of them is on our on this call here, uh, Ravita Raman, we are pushing a district to recognize that if you were to dissect the curriculum, most times the only time you're going to discuss people of color are at points of trauma in our history. And so it's trauma compounded on trauma. We're discussing trauma. I'm being traumatized by discussing the trauma. And I'm traumatized by discussing the trauma of the trauma because this is where I see myself in the curriculum, right? And so I encourage us to um, teach these traumatic moments, yes, but also expand our lens on how we view the history of people of color in the United States. The last thing I would say is there's many leaders on this call um, many people who are directors and CEOs and entrepreneurs and founders. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, has become very on trend. I'm in the dark again. Um, and so everybody has put in money to start training and doing unconscious bias sessions and um, at their job places of work. I would encourage us, you ask what can an individual do? An individual leader could start to offer those as um, a benefit to their team and their families. We don't have to wait for public schools to, to talk us through it. If your job has put in uh, the resources for uh, anti-racism training, unconscious bias, the history of white supremacy, well, all those different sessions that hap are happening now, thank goodness, in many of our companies, well, hey, have it for your staff. Let them invite their kids, have a kid version of it. Right, so there's some things that we can do without being fully dependent upon the schools because if we're quite honest, we put a lot on the schools and they're great places for socialization and they should be having conversations about race, yes, but they're not the only places and we can't fully put upon the shoulders of the education system to fully teach 
the history here and to help uh, dismantle uh, the system of racism. Uh, one thing I'm going to take a point of privilege. I was in the fifth grade, the only black student in an integrated school. Uh, that year was very traumatic for me personally. However, I did have advocates that were some of the other students, white students who felt as though I was being treated unfairly. And I knew this. One of the things that is brought up in this whole conversation, which I'm very frustrated about personally, is the idea that teaching this history will traumatize the children in the classroom. And here's one thing that I do think about that at the YW, we have domestic violence services. And I've always said that that is a trauma that is recognized, but the trauma of racism is often overlooked and not recognized. And I want to ask very quickly for a panel member to tell me what they feel about this argument that somehow teaching this re-traumatizes white children or traumatizes them for actions that they are they had nothing to do with. I'll start with you really quick, Dr. Bug. Uh, well, I think with any topic is how you teach it. Right. Of course, if you have a small child and you go in and you say, you know what, little white girl, you should be ashamed. Your ancestors raped and pillaged. Like, of course, that is traumatic, right, for anybody. And so it's just about how you approach this. I think everything, no one is too young to talk about racism. No one is too young to talk about history. And of course, with any educator, we know that you do it in a developmentally appropriate way. Um, and so I, I think to put a blanket statement to say that just discussing race period is traumatic for white children or makes them to feel guilt. I think that is just an oversimplification that people are using to get around this, this topic. Um, I also think it, it, can, it further punctuates the point around white supremacy because we're centering the feelings of white students over the continued experiences of kids of color throughout the centuries of public education. Um, and so we have to have a both and we want to take care of white kids, black kids, Latino kids, every kid that's in our in seats in our classrooms should be felt that they matter, that their histories matter, that their futures matter, and that we're here to wrap our arms around them in that way and get them there, not to um, conceal things, not to traumatize them, not to harm them, but to support the kids because that's our job in, in the education space. Okay, Ms. Black. I co-sign on everything Dr. Bug just said. The only thing I will add to her comment is that as, as, as an educator, I think what we could do is we could realize that when we're coming from the frame, any historic time period or any part of history we're teaching, I think we, we make it known as practitioners that we understand that the point of history was written for the winners, okay? Let's start there. And I think we create that narrative. So if we understand that history was written for the winners, just look at, I don't know, take your war. Let's look at the Revolutionary War. If the Revolutionary War was written differently, um, as opposed to the fight against tyranny and the fight for freedom, had it been won another way, we would be telling a different story. So I think we open, we come into the space teaching as practitioners and educators with knowing saying that history was written for the winners. What would have happened with these critical questions we place on our students, we ask them, give them space to be critical in their thinking. Um, and, and also realize that here, you know, I think Ms. Gonzalez talked about this idea of, of this country and how we, you know, and, and the idea of looking at other countries. Well, we know that in Germany, the history of the Holocaust will always be taught. And the history of the Holocaust is taught, not necessarily that this idea that individuals are personally responsible for it. So if we could actually learn how they are using teaching the Holocaust without teaching personal harm, but also holding society accountable and do all that. And we know it can be done because we see it being done all over the country. Okay, Ms. Gonzalez. Yeah, I would co-sign what Dr. Bug and also Ms. Blackman have also said. And I think I would just add that um, we know that these issues are like systemic and then by passing legislation or prohibiting and passing policies that are similar, it's to systematically sustain this harm and violence. So having these conversations, I mean, it's not by coincidence. I think it's by design that these conversations are not 
that they don't want us to have these conversations in schools. Because imagine teaching the realities, even to a classroom full of white children or non-Black children, and for them to begin to question, because that's what happens when you are taught reality or taught facts and truth. The idea is that their socio-political development, they're, they're gonna question, they're gonna probe, they're gonna wanna know the why. And then that's when you start questioning systems that still exist and persist that are harmful. And that's how then you can dismantle. So I don't think it's by coincidence that legislation like this keep, pass like keep passing or other policies that are similar because the people at the very top and who are in control, often white cisgendered men, they, they want to hold and hoard power and the dominance that they have over American culture and society. Um, so I think we start by having these conversations. And I think again, taking into account also what Dr. Bug and Ms. Blackman have said. Okay, Dr. Williams. Thank you. I, um, I think our kids are a lot more sophisticated than we give them credit. I, um, this is a quick exercise for those of you that have children. Um, bring them out here to Hermitage where I live and have them go into one of the Kroger's and then take them to the Kroger and maybe North Nashville. Mm -hmm. Same store, um, but you will notice a, a difference there. Um, that's not traumatizing to the child, that is reality. And I would humbly submit to you that it would cause them to ask questions. Um, what really will traumatize them is to find out that for all of these long years, you have been lying to them mm -hmm. as a parent or as a teacher, whatever whatever the, the case may be. Um, I don't, I, 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 I heard that statement about that child in Arizona being traumatized. And I, and, and, tried not to laugh, but I, I think that the, the true trauma was with the guy that was introduced in the bill that um, would actually, was actually a response to their power, to their authority being challenged. And, and mindful of this, that we don't have to go way out to Arizona to witness that. You can see that right here in town we um we're working on putting up um with the equal justice initiative we're working on putting up lynching memorials here in davidson county we're starting to get some pushback from that in terms of why traumatize the community where we're talking about putting them at and um my response was that this was a part of the healing process because we have been dealing with trauma all these long years and until we acknowledge that this thing is happening, we can't move beyond it. So um, we're putting this memorial up, not for, you know, just for the adults, but for the children. This is an opportunity to teach. And in looking at history, not everything is rosy. They're, even within our own lives, there are good things and there are bad things, but we use them to to um, um, to better ourselves oftentimes and to present an image of ourselves to the world. So history, good and bad, the, the, the joys and the trauma are useful in our development. All right, well, this has exceeded all expectations. I thank all of our panelists. I will say this is that we've had quite a number of questions we were not able to get to. Uh, I'll, I'll go out here on a limb, but I believe that each one of these individuals is available and they may charge you though, to, to speak to your groups to really educate you on that smaller level. That is the step that you can take. Bring one of these experts to the table to talk to your group, to let them go deeper into some of the subjects that we've just touched the surface on in this conversation. But this is why the YW does this work in becoming the CEO. I wanted to beef up our advocacy efforts. And this is the reason that we have these sorts of, of lunch and learns. So I thank my panelists. I thank those of you. I apologize. We did not get to your questions, 
but you can reach any of these uh, panelists and ask them. Uh, go a deeper question, have lunch, talk about these issues, and that's so that we can spread this information to the community at large. So I thank you all for being here today, and each and every one of you take care of yourselves. So thank you. <laughs>